Good evening, sir. Good evening, Asha. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Prashant. How are you? I am fine, thank you, sir. How are you, sir? I am also okay. Lockdown from tomorrow. Yes, sir. Sir, did you find the name of the anthropologist? You said the. Uh, um, no, not find. I have to remember. Um, actually, uh, you don't know this, but uh, immediately after your class, I sit with uh, one of my PhD scholars. And uh, we actually edit a book. Now, edit a book means that, let me explain how this book came into being. It came into being because of the fact that we held a seminar. And most of the time, people don't present papers. They'll just come and speak. So to bring out a book, what I started doing is that uh, uh, I started recording. I tell people this. This is not this is no secret. Since you're not uh, giving me papers, I'll record whatever you speak, transcribe it, and then edit it. Edit it in the sense that it has to look like uh, a paper presentation. So it's a very difficult task. Usually, I never had so many speakers. <clears throat> now I have nearly 20 speakers. Uh, who's the thing that I'm having to sit and go through. And there was one section, there is one section on gender, which is killing me. 
because I'm not very familiar with beyond the usual names. I'm not very familiar with uh, femi feminist uh, uh, scholarship. I don't know uh, most of the names. I know a few like Judith Butler, Monique Plaza, but these people have used other people, which means I have to, they, they use a last name and it's difficult to get the spelling. And if you crack this, you have to crack the spelling and then you have to, uh, what, what do I say? Uh, you have to kind of uh, uh, um, you have to search if that is the correct name or not. Uh, you have to get the full name because they'll only say something like butler. Then I'll have to find out what butler. So that kind of thing, it's a very, very uh, arduous and killing process. So immediately after I finish your class, I start that. And therefore I've had no time to think about this. Just, just let me try to um, remember uh, once I'm done with this class, uh, I might have some time. So I'll then try to sit and remember. I've had no time to sit and think that is the problem. So, I don't know, some names just poof, they go out of my head sometimes. Why it happens, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. So give me a day, uh, hopefully by tomorrow, I'll be able to tell you what it is. <clears throat> so shall we get going? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, this is what we have to do first so that we will get to understanding, uh, we will get to uh, understanding the whole idea of positivism later on empiricism and uh, then of course uh, as a refutation of positivism and empiricism uh, we will have to do the interpretative method uh, and uh, the interpretative method, I will be touching upon a few important people. 
uh, the I will dwell mostly upon uh, mostly upon uh, um, what that name has gone out of my head. Yeah, uh, Wilhelm Delthai and uh, uh, Hans Kardema. But I'll also be making uh, uh, references to people like Vico and Herder. And uh, I will also probably talk about Richard Rorty. Uh, so, and uh, when we do uh, uh, when we do Hans Kadama, we also have to do Jacques Derrida and apart from Jacques Derrida we also have to do a little bit of Michel Foucault. Uh, all of these coming under the category of uh, linguistic um, philosophy. So, but if you have to understand positivism and the concerns that it had and uh, why was it so desperate to construct a social science uh, if you try to understand that because positivism was very, very desperate to construct social science and it didn't happen. And um, then if time permits and if you permit, more importantly, uh, we'll also do logical positivism, uh, which is supposed to be an improvement over uh, the original positivism. Uh, logical positivism is also called the Vienna Circle. We'll talk about that. Okay. Talking about the origins of the modern scientific method, we have to visit ancient Greece once and uh, we will do so only very briefly because I don't want to spend too much time talking to you about uh, things that we have already talked about. The first thing to understand is that when we talk about a scientific method, we have to pay our respects to the Malaysian, what is this? Okay, most of what emerged 
as modern science uh, has something or the other to do with the Malaysian school because those are the those were the uh, three people who were uh, trying to what should I say um, they were trying to understand the world in naturalist terms or in a naturalist language so that is what we find among the Malaysians and that is why we have to consider them as the originators of uh, some kind of primitive science. Now, they will be called philosophers and uh, Thales of the Malaysian school is often called the first ever philosopher. Now you must understand that uh, the dichotomy between philosophy and uh, uh, science that we see today uh, is not a dichotomy that existed for the Greeks. Okay, uh, the Greeks believed in interchangeably using science and philosophy. You could use either of the two terms, which is something that we can't do today. But for them, that was fine because they didn't see any dichotomy. They didn't see any necessity to see them as two different things. So if you are looking at uh, this kind of a thing, what you have to consider therefore is that it is with the Greeks that the whole scientific form of thinking came into being, uh, especially because of the usage uh, of mathematics by people like Pythagoras, Plato and uh, people like him okay and uh, if if you are uh, basically looking at the modern scientific method the modern scientific method has to be located in a particular uh, context. So let us understand the context in which the modern scientific method came into being. I'm insisting on calling it the modern scientific method uh, for a reason. The reason being that the modern scientific method is very different from the original scientific method that was used by the Greeks. Now we have to do a little bit of history here. And if we, <clears throat> sorry, if you do this little bit of history here, what you will find is, I told you after Aristotle, uh, you have this phase of Greek history called the Hellenistic Greek Greece. Okay, and the Hellenistic Greek, Greece 
represents the decline of um, Greek civilization. In place of the Hellenistic Greek civilization, uh, in place of the declining Greek civilization, uh, we have first and foremost the rise of the Roman Republic. Again, please remember that the Roman Republic is not a republic as we understand it today. It is not something like we understand it today. It is something which is very different. Can you just give me a minute, please? One minute. Sorry about that. Uh, I told you that the Roman Republic had institutions such as the Senate. It had the institution of the king who was answerable to the Senate. And you also had uh, a separate uh, kind of uh, division uh, for the judiciary. It wasn't called the judiciary then. They were simply called the magistrates. But as I told you, Cicero, uh, Seneca, the older, all these people were concerned with jurisprudence and with the codification of laws. Now, it is this process of codification of laws, which actually led to the first proper legal system, first proper legal system in the world in the Roman Republic. Okay, and in the Roman Republic, uh, I mean, sorry, the Roman Republic didn't last very long even though the codification of laws was continued, uh, it was because of Julius Caesar. And please remember, I told you, Caesar is not his uh, title as, because later Roman emperors co also called themselves Caesars. Uh, it was his name and his full name was Julius Caesar. And with the Julius Caesar, you have the conversion of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. Okay, and the scholar Gibbons sings peons about what the Roman Empire was. And uh, what you need to 
understand, we have discussed this before, the span of the Roman Empire is breathtaking. Uh, it is huge. But what the Roman Empire did was that it unified territory, but failed to unify people. Even though nation is a Latin word and it was very much there in the Roman period. Yesterday when I was talking about the nation states, I told you that when you look at the nation states, what you find is that uh, it's a modern phenomenon. It's not there before. And I had talked about the Roman Empire then. I mean, just see the extent to which the Roman Empire existed. Did this empire represent one nation? It didn't because people didn't have a sense of belonging to the Roman Empire. So what was the reason behind the failure to unify people? Now, the Romans had a belief which was that if If uh, you conquered someone, then those people are your subjects. These are not people who are uh, your equals because after all you conquered them. So if you look at the codification of laws, and if you look at Roman jurisprudence, there is a marked, very, very marked discrimination between the Romans and those whom they conquered. Okay, so the people who were conquered by the Romans didn't see themselves as willing members of the Roman Empire because of the fact that there was differential treatment given to the Romans and to the people that they had conquered in various territories. Now, <clears throat> there is also another angle to this. The other angle is that there were some territories which voluntarily, without really fighting, uh, without really fighting the Romans, they surrendered to the Romans and they actually became protectorates. Okay, so you have the Palestinian region, uh, which was a Roman protectorate, 
and the Roman uh, protectorate usually had a tribune, T R I B U A G, who would be in charge of the protectorate. And uh, the person who was in charge of the Palestinian region was Pontius Pilate. Okay. Actually, it should be pronounced Pontius. That is the Latin pronunciation, but I'm not going to do that. Sounds terrible. So, it is Pontius Pilate. And uh, what happened was that the Roman Empire developed, <clears throat> sorry, the Roman Empire developed this well-oiled machinery, which became uh, insurmountable. Okay, there was no army in the world that would conquer the Romans. They grew from strength to strength and as they grew in strength, it became more and more impossible for other countries, kingdoms to conquer them. Now, if you read the historian James L. Weiser, put it here. He makes a brilliant uh, point. He says, while the Romans were scripting their victories, they were also scripting their future and it was the Romans who basically were responsible for the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay? They were responsible for that. And how were this, how does Wiser justify this? Wiser justifies this by calling the Roman civilization as He calls the, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Roman civilization a universal pragmatic civilization. Here we are not using pragmatic in the uh, present context. 
where when we say something is pragmatic, uh, we mean something which is opportunistic and is willing to compromise on several things. So please remember that pragmatic carries different meanings. One meaning is what I told you. Pragmatism is being opportunist, compromising on ethics and morality. The Americans have their own meaning. They have their uh, system uh, of philosophy, which is called uh, the pragmatic school of philosophy. And uh, in the pragmatic school, you have people like Henry James, you have uh, John Dewey, and uh, you also have the great Richard Rorty. Okay, so these people call themselves pragmatists. But by that, they were not saying by that they were not saying that you know the Roman uh, sorry they are not trying to say that the Americans were being opportunistic or immoral okay they were being pragmatic as in being purely practical not aiming to reach what cannot be reached. And uh, Richard Rorty used a very interesting word to describe his own pragmatism and American pragmatism. He said, we are fuzzies, F-U-Z-Z, why? When you say something is fuzzy, it's not very clear, right? The lines are blurred. So he says that American pragmatism is deliberately fuzzy because it is something that wants to have a goal and it doesn't believe that the traditional methods suggested by various philosophers are likely to accomplish their goals or its goals. So therefore he called himself and the others fuzzies. So that is American pragmatism for you. Okay, now, and it's called the American Pragmatic School. The meaning that is being used here is quite close to the American uh, idea. <clears throat> it is based in practicality. Okay. Uh, but it was not just based in practicality. It was based in practice of dogmas. I hope you know what dogmas are. Dogmas are those which are not proven to be correct. But if you cling on to them, then you become dogmatic. Okay? Which is that you're not willing to listen to any opposition 
to what you have to say. You believe that what you said is right. Even if somebody shows evidence to the contrary. So here we have this universal pragmatic civilization. And if you look at, please look at an old English dictionary. By that I mean an old dictionary which was printed around the 50s, 1950s, 1940s. You will find that it says one of the synonyms of pragmatic is dogmatic. So the idea of a universal pragmatic civilization, according to James Weiser, is based in this idea of dogma. It is dogmatic and therefore it is pragmatic. It is also practical, no doubt about it. They didn't do things that they thought were impractical. They did things after weighing the pros and cons properly, but they were also dogmatic in their beliefs, not just about their superiority, but various other beliefs about their gods. And I mention that because the dispute that the Romans had with Jesus Christ began there. Now, I will get to that point in a minute. But before I get to that point, so for James Weiser, this was a civilization based in military might but it had scripted its own downfall because of the fact that while it successfully united large chunks of territory, it was not able to unite people. People didn't have a sense of belonging to the Roman Empire. So, he says, the appeal and popularity of Jesus Christ lay in his Jesus defying the Romans and calling himself the son of God and the word Christ means prophet. So he also called himself and a messiah of the downtrodden. Some people might question what is the difference between a prophet and a messiah. Okay, 
they say they are both the same that is not true a prophet is seen as one who is used by god as a vessel for conveying knowledge divine knowledge to the people okay that is what a prophet is a messiah is also someone who will work for the upliftment of those who are downtrodden so that is the difference between prophet and messiah a messiah rescues the downtrodden okay now jesus defied the romans and called himself son of god because the romans believed apollo is the head god and jesus said i told you in hebrew and also probably in yiddish uh the word god uh basically means no name and therefore by extension no shape yiddish also use another word which is yave okay which is almost similar not almost it is similar to the idea of god it uses this particular word and you will also see that is islam which is a part of the same tradition of abrahamic religions when they call god allah it means allah is doesn't have a name allah is not a name god is not a name they all mean no name okay so what you have to therefore remember is that the romans had their gods okay they had a pantheon of gods and uh, here is somebody who's coming and saying i am the son of god and god is somebody who has no name and god is somebody who doesn't have a form okay and if you look at all the roman gods they are anthropomorphic i told you anthropomorphic anthrop a n t h r o p e anthrop is uh, the human being and morphic comes from morphology morphology is the external features of something so having the features or the appearance of a human being is anthropomorphic so the greek gods were anthropomorphic the roman gods were anthropomorphic <clears throat> unlike the god that jesus christ was talking about and saying that this god is my father but you can't see him you can't have an idea you can't imbibe him through your senses you have to imbibe him through your faith okay if you have faith in him he shall reveal knowledge to you and jesus christ 
preached nonviolence and compassion nonviolence and compassion were his main teachings <clears throat> i don't know if you were if you're familiar with the sermon on the mount okay which is a sermon that jesus delivered to his followers and in that he said this famous thing which in india we attribute to gandhi gandhi also said that but he is not the original uh, he is not the one who said it originally what did jesus say when somebody asked him what do we do if somebody attacks us physically jesus said don't resist if they slap you on your right cheek then show them your left cheek and ask them to slap you there okay so the gandhian uh theory of non violence owes itself in a very big way to christianity to jesus christ gandhi was an ardent follower of uh, the russian writer leon uh, not leon sorry what leo tolstoy hmm leo tolstoy yeah leo tolstoy i was saying leon so leo tolstoy he was a huge influence on gandhi and uh, it is through tolstoy that gandhi imbibed the values that were preached by jesus christ and gandhi if you read his autobiography he basically says that he was immensely immensely impressed and overcome with admiration for what jesus christ said in the sermon on the mount so in more ways than one he was actually also people will tell you that he talked about sanatana dharma which is very true which is very true but he didn't just talk about sanatana dharma he also talked about other things and one of them most of them are christian you know what uh, he told a christian he said i admire your jesus christ but i don't admire you christians and so this person asked him why are you saying that how can you admire jesus christ and christianity but not admire christians he said you people have not understood jesus christ you people have abandoned the teachings of jesus christ so that's what he said very famously anyway let's come back to jesus christ 
Now, he preached on violence and compassion. And because of the fact that he was not only preaching compassion, one more parallel between Jesus and Gandhi is that they led by example. They are not like our scholars who appear on Bhakti TV, sit on a big throne, have lots of garlands, and if they could, I'm sure they would even put a uh, what is that thing called? I've forgotten. Anyway, uh, they would they sit and talk rubbish. It's not rubbish, okay? Let's give them their due, but they don't practice it. They don't practice it. But Jesus led by example. Jesus first and foremost went to lepers. L-E-P-E-R-S, lepers, people who were suffering from leprosy. And leprosy, according to the Bible, later on, is a plague. You must understand that today when we talk about a plague, we talk about a bubonic plague or a pneumonic plague, which is... Uh, transmitted uh, to human beings through what is called the rat fly. Okay, a fly that has uh, sucked blood out of a rat. And it's not really a fly, it's a mosquito, essentially. If that thing bites the human being, then it causes plague. So that is what is actually called a zoonotic disease. Z-O-O-N-O-T-I-C. Zoonotic is carried from animals to human beings. And if you look at uh, the present pandemic, it is supposed to have started with a bat. Okay. It's supposed to have come from a bat. That's what the Chinese say. And the rest of the world says, this is a biological weapon manufactured in the Wuhan laboratory and unleashed on the world. So let's not go there. Those are conspiracy theories no proof. Uh, and uh, so we are talking about Jesus. Jesus went to the lepers. Jesus went to those who were suffering from ill health. Jesus went to those people who were traumatized. People who were traumatized. And this is most important. He's going to the traumatized because the Romans, by discriminating against those whom they conquered, actually were traumatizing them. So, Jesus was like a salve, S-A-L-V, or a soothing balm, B-A-L-M. And through his compassion, he told all these people that in the eyes of God, all are equal. Okay, so he preached equality not the kind of equality that Marx talked about, which is a distributive equality and has a material component to it. His equality was a spiritual equality. 
okay and he also said those who basically suffer in this world will not suffer in the next world and because they will not suffer in the next world they'll have eternal life and they'll be in paradise so these teachings were really like a soothing balm to those who were suffering under the yoke of oppression of the romans so this is the beginning of the downfall of the roman empire and wiser calls christianity a universal spiritual civilization that is what he calls it spirit okay is not to be spiritual sorry first let me deal with that spiritual is not to be understood as something which has to do with you know meditation and those kind of things no not that kind of spiritual okay spiritual is that which deals with this spirit okay you'll say compassion is the spirit of mankind not you will say jesus said that compassion is the spirit of mankind or if you see somebody arguing a point out you'll say that is a spirited defense of your position so spiritual is that thing that you don't see but unifies people so christianity grew very very quickly the teachings of jesus became legendary they spread very quickly throughout the roman empire so the roman empire had actually created territorial integration and failed to unify the people in that territory and what was done by jesus christ was to spiritually unite them so the roman empire started finding that people because of this non violence and when when they were threatened with life they were threatened with violence jesus said meet that violence with non violence if they want to kill you let them kill you don't retaliate how many people will they kill that is what he said in the sermon on the mount okay and so the christians did exactly that those who became followers of christ called themselves christians and 
they wouldn't offer resistance. Now the Romans under Pontius Pilate decided to punish Jesus Christ because otherwise it looked like he was going to he was going to uh, <clears throat> sorry that he was going to become a challenge to the power of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was ready to meet the challenge of a military uh, yeah, it was ready to meet a challenge of a military type, but it was not ready for this. Okay, it was not ready for this and they didn't know how to react. So they started putting these people on crosses and nailing them to those crosses. But people said, okay, we'll die on the cross. It's not one Jesus who died on the cross. There were several other people who died on the cross. And so the problem became out of control. Nobody's challenging your authority directly, but nobody's listening to you. They're willing to give up their life rather than listen to you. So that is what actually made Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher Akshepunit, because he wanted to understand. Marcus Aurelius was the first Roman emperor who wanted to understand what is this thing called Christianity? How is it able to withstand the might of Roman Empire? How is it able to actually resist the Roman Empire by dying as well. That's what made him a philosopher because he started asking himself these questions. And Mill, John Stuart Mill, is actually very impressed with John, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, so Marcus Aurelius did have a great deal of influence on John Stuart Mill and some other modern philosophers. So you will find that it is because of this introspection, the process of introspection uh, that was done by Marcus Aurelius, uh, trying to philosophically understand what was happening that it all culminated in Christianity becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire and the transformation to the Holy Roman Empire. I told you this story. Now just give me five minutes Now, the growth
if you see one kind of dogmatic belief uh, that the Romans had, the Christian civilization, which started off as a universal spiritual civilization, which preached non-violence and preached uh, compassion, it was losing all these qualities. The clergy took over. There was a Holy Roman Emperor, but the Pope and his clerics were more powerful than the Roman Emperor. The Roman Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor couldn't do anything without consulting the Pope and his clerics. And so what do you find? You find that the Bible is seen as ultimate knowledge because it is the revelation of divine wisdom. It is the revelation of divine wisdom. So it is ultimate knowledge. So we know whatever we have to know. Now, what do you have to do? you have to keep the faith in the Bible alive. So, reason was a quality that was seen as the instrument of the devil and those who tried to be rational were seen as heretics and they were given horrible punishments. I told you, please read Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Read that chapter, which is called uh, The Spectacle of the Scaffold. Okay, I must have talked to you about this at some point. So you'll see that, you know, people, if they disagreed with the Bible or if they question, why should we do this? Then they were burnt at stake in public. That's why it's called the spectacle. What the Christians were trying to do is that they were trying to draw compliance through fear, fear of punishment. Okay, that's why Foucault calls that book Discipline and Punish. Okay, so people were burnt at stake. The stake was a pole around which a funeral pyre was arranged and people would be burnt alive or the four limbs would be tried to tied to four different horses and the horses made to run in different directions, tearing the body apart. So they were doing all these things, which were antichrist teachings. This is not what Jesus Christ taught. And later on, if you see the Spanish Inquisition, which came in to protect Catholicism from Protestantism, it had even worse punishments. 
It had even worse punishments. It used to bend people's bodies backward through instruments and break their back. The guillotine was one of the inventions of the Spanish Inquisition. Those who were not Catholics were called infidels. So here, those who questioned something about Christianity were called infidels. If people tried to use their reason, they said, you are under the influence of the devil. So you have faith. versus reason. Those who had faith were believers in God who would go to heaven. Those who tried to use reason were under the influence of the devil and would go to hell and burn in hell for eternity. Okay, so they said, don't try to investigate about don't try to investigate about uh, the nature of uh, the the nature of the world their argument was if you if you did not create something then you will not understand it This is the argument of the church. If you did not create something, you will not understand it. And the corollary to that was God created the universe. So only God knows how it works. Human rationality did not possess the ability to unravel the creation of God. And hence you are under the spell of the devil. Right? So, God created the universe, only he knows. You didn't create the universe. Too bad for you people. You will never know. And if you try to know using your reason, that is because it's the devil who's drawing you away from God. That is what they said. So they said, don't use your faculty of reason, rationality. And therefore, in this particular time, uh, sorry, therefore, this particular time, came to be called the Dark Ages because no new knowledge came up. No new knowledge came up and this was a time when in Europe all efforts at producing new knowledge was stopped by the church 
and therefore the middle ages or the medieval period if you want to call it call it that is also called the dark ages there is no light here ancient greece was luminescent to a certain extent roman empire as well but in the middle ages which coincide with the rise of christendom you have darkness you don't have light there's only darkness okay so if you look at that particular thing you will understand why people were increasingly growing impatient with christianity why were they growing impatient with christianity okay because somehow they didn't find it right and on the one hand you had pastors and preachers standing at the pulpit in the church and saying things like Jesus Christ preach compassion non-violence and out in society you find the same church practicing violence lack of compassion all these things so just like the roman empire scripted its own downfall the christian civilization some people call it the christian empire also scripted its own downfall the difference is jesus christ was not a part of the roman civilization he wasn't among the ranks of the romans but with the renaissance and with the knowledge of posterity the luminescent knowledge of posterity becoming available to scholars because of the renaissance and the subsequent reformation that protested against the unfair and unchristian policies of the church you find that the attack came from within martin luther king was almost single handedly responsible for bringing down the roman church just as jesus christ did i say martin luther king sorry if i said that martin luther martin luther king is a black american leader sorry very if i said that i, I correct myself here martin luther was somebody who said uh, i mean who said this there's nothing christian about this church and therefore you had the reformation the protestant ethic and along with that the rise of reason and once the rise of reason began then we was we start seeing the scientific form of thinking returning people try to answer the old questions that were 
raised and attempted to be answered by the Greeks, those questions again became the center of European civilization and people tried to find answers to that. So, you will see that one of the first or the most nascent scientific methods is that which is called This is the earliest scientific method documented. I'll let you off now. I'm sure you are pulling your hair out. Tomorrow, we start with the scientific method. We start with the Resolutive Compositive Method then we move on to other things and get into positivism. Okay, thank you very much. I had to tell you that story of the Roman Empire because unless you understand all these things, historically, what I believe in is that you have to teach ideas historically. You have to locate them in their context. No idea emerges without a context. There will always be a context for a new idea to emerge. There'll always be a context. Okay, so the resolutive Compositive method is the first known scientific method and that is what we will do tomorrow. Any Thank questions? You, no questions? No. Okay. All right. So how many are left? Eight. Okay. Yeah. That's quite a lot. I expect it to be three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, please come back tomorrow. Yes, sir. From okay. now on, you'll get into totally unfamiliar territory. I, from, okay. with starting with the resolutive compositive method, we will be getting into a territory that I have not covered with you before. Okay, and like I said, this is the basis for the interpretative theory or interpretative method, hermeneutic, as it is called. So, I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.